So our topic is business ethics. We'll start with the definition of what ethics is. <clears throat> we'll start with just a basic Webster dictionary um, definition. It's the rules of behavior based on ideas about what is morally good and bad. An additional definition, um, just from the business dictionary, a ba the basic concepts and fundamental principles of decent human conduct. And then we'll uh, some of the other terms we think of when we think of ethics would include character, morality, honesty, values, fairness. Those are things that we think of in conjunction with ethics. We'll expand the definition a little bit to include business ethics, which looks beyond just the <coughs> ethics itself and expands that to include social responsibilities, including that to the general public. So that's our definition of business ethics. Then I'm going to be brave and jump out of business and attempt a little philosophical analogy. <laughs> Very daring for me. Um, <clears throat> so we have the footbridge dilemma. Maybe you've seen this before. So we have a guy up here. This is you. You're this little guy here. And the dilemma is, would you push this bigger guy off the tracks, off the bridge, down onto the tracks, in order to stop the train from passing by and running over these people here? <laughs> Our options are push the big guy off or don't push the big guy off. And think about what you would do in that situation. And some people would say, well, you know, I would jump off and I would stop the train. But the problem is, you're too little. You're this little skinny guy. It's going to take the weight of this bigger feller to stop the train from coming through and running over these folks that look like they're um, strapped to the track down there. <clears throat> so <laughs> our first option is to push. So you push the guy off. It saves the lives of the others that are laying on the tracks. This would be a utilitarian uh, theory, which says that we're doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So we sacrifice one to save five. The other option is not to push, which <coughs> would be a denotologist um, theory, which is like an ultimate right theory that says, I have to do the right thing. It doesn't matter what the consequences are. I have to do the right thing. The right thing would be to not push the gentleman off of the bridge. And another example of this theory would be <coughs> if someone comes up to you and says, it, and they have a firearm in their hands and says, where does such and such live? I'm here to you know, take them out. You would have to, under this theory, the second theory, say, you know, he lives at such and such and such and such because I cannot tell a lie. I cannot say something that's incorrect. So that's an example of the second theory. <coughs> Most people shown this diagram here would choose the second, not to push the guy off of the bridge. Second scenario. We have the trolley switch. <coughs> sort of the same thing. Here you, here you are. The trolley is a runaway trolley. He's coming down the tracks here. He's set to run over these people. Would you flip the switch and cause the trolley to veer off and only run over one person? So given this scenario, which would you choose? Would you flip the switch or you w would you re let it remain like it is? Most people would choose to flip the switch <coughs> <clears throat> and save more lives. Do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. The other option then would be to not flip the switch. Come on. <laughs> okay, there we go. <clears throat> and, not, and not sacrifice the, the guy over here. So people that have seen this one before they see the, the uh, footbridge, <coughs> usually have a different response. If they've seen the, the trolley first, then they tend to say, uh, follow the Unitarian method or the ideology and choose to push the feller off, the, off of the bridge to save the others underneath there. So what is the point? The moral of the story, sometimes we have inconsistencies in our decisions and actions and sometimes we change our minds um, given additional time to think about it. That's the end of my philosophical discussion. <laughs> I'll get back to business now. So what factors influence business ethics within a company? An individual's morals, 
their character can have an impact on um, ethical decisions that they make. Those things can be influenced by your upbringing, your religion, your personal experiences, family background, organizational values. For example, were you a Boy Scout as you, in your younger days? And did that teach you uh, morals and character, as well as professional norms? Um, the tone at the top and the culture of an entity have a huge bearing on the ethics and the ethical decisions that the company makes. If you have poor ethics at the top of the business, that's very likely to trickle down below. It's very difficult for lower level employees to withstand ethical pressures if the top of the tier doesn't adhere to them. So for example, if you are <coughs> a lower level employee and you know that your boss fabricates his travel expenses, then the lower level employees are more likely to do the same. Okay? Just a quote there. Where there are good leaders, there will be good ethical practices in business. Ethical fading, just kind of some terminology, refers to an erosion of the ethical standards of a business. So when ethical choices are made poorly, and then they continue to be, continue to be, continue to be, until there's ethical fading within the entity. Another definition <coughs> is group thinking. So that says if there are a group of people and you have one holdout, sometimes I would imagine this happens in a jury trial, you have a holdout, they tend to cave in and give in to the group itself just to come to a conclusion and to move forward. Things that, are, things that happen when there's poor ethical decision, you, poor ethical decisions, usually the person is greedy and looking for personal gain or, and or they are feeling pressure from within the company and has, have been influenced by the culture of the corporation. The results, damage to the reputation of the business, loss of customers, loss of investors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Who wants to do business with an uh, organization that has poor ethical values? Versus the other side, <coughs> why would we want to have good ethics? Because it's just good business and it's morally correct. Some of the positive results that we can see from positive ethical decisions being made can attract customers or clients, improve employee retentions. Employees want to work as long as they're ethical. They want to work someplace where ethics is held to a high standard. And it, it can appeal to investors. Some examples might be Tom's Shoes. <coughs> they give away a pair of shoes for every pair of shoes that they sell. So people, some people are more inclined to buy Tom's Shoes then because they know of that, what they do. Patagonia, very well known for their um, high standards as far as the environment goes, protecting the environment, treating their employees well. So some people are more willing to pay more for Patagonia's products and invest in their company because of the high moral standards that they hold. So then I kind of did the good, the bad, and the ugly. <coughs> I wanted to play, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> I had a little trouble incorporating that into my PowerPoint. <laughs> so I could whistle, but that wouldn't do me any good either. <laughs> So good things when we're talking about ethics in business. Tylenol, you guys are old enough to remember the Tylenol scare. Mm -hmm. Or not scare, the yeah. tragedy I should say. Yeah. So September of 1982, seven Chicagoans died from cyanide poisoning. <coughs> However, it was not Tylenol's fault. They, um, someone had stole the Tylenol off of the shelves in the grocery stores, in the um, drug stores, laced it with cyanide, put the capsules back together, put them on the shelf. So Johnson & Johnson was not at fault. It wasn't, it wasn't their problem. The, the contamination did not take place in their factories, in their distribution centers. It all came from the retail stores. Um, however, Tylenol took this on themselves. They pulled 31 million bottles off the shelves <coughs> at a cost of $100 million to the company. They replaced all the tablets or the capsules with caplets that could not be tampered with. This is also where we got sealed mm. packages. Prior to that, nothing was sealed. And now kids today don't know anything that's not sealed. Mm -hmm. Everything is sealed now. 
So <coughs> Johnson & Johnson dis demonstrated um, honesty with the public. Initially, their stock plummeted. However, as the public saw that they were taking care of the public, putting the public in front of their own financial needs, <coughs> the market recovered. So initially they lost, uh, they were 35%, dropped down to eight, and then after a year or so, they regained their market shares back because the, co the public had confidence in the company itself. So based on public perception, coupons, they also had to do coupons, a lot of advertising, and given discounts, it did lead to the recovery of the company. And th that's something that could have uh, destroyed them totally, especially if they just said, oh, that wasn't us, you know. But there were seven people that died. Uh, first was a little girl, and then the second was a gentleman, and his brother and sister-in-law had come to his house at, for the funeral. They took the same Tylenol he took off of the counter, mm -hmm. and they both died as well. They found additional bottles that were contaminated and still on the shelves. No one was ever prosecuted for this. There was a gentleman who um, sent a, like a ransom note to Johnson & Johnson, million bucks and I'll quit poisoning people. Mm -hmm. However, it was found that he really wasn't the, he wasn't the one. He was just looking for the pu publicity. So, and so now we have these improved packages that should prevent that. <clears throat> so I did the good. Now here's the bad. Volkswagen. This is very recent. Okay. So they are, they have been, they did cheat on emission standards. <coughs> 11 million diesel vehicles out there <coughs> with improper emissions controls. They, um, when plugged into the emissions computers, and they know they're being tested, then all of a sudden they produce the correct emissions. Otherwise, they don't. So to keep the um, power up in the vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, they went around the emissions controls. So 482,000 of those are in the United States, 11 million altogether. Oop, there goes my flipper. So EPA could, could penalize Volkswagen up to $37,500 per vehicle, potentially 18 billion in fines, although that's all still um, up in the air. If intent can be proven, they could face criminal charges also. Impact on the market, so Volkswagen went from 170 down to 124. This is kind of a timeline of what happened. They dropped even further at one time and made a little bit of a rebound. Mm -hmm. So that shows the impact that poor ethical decisions can have on a company. And then, um, a little embarrassing to talk about the accounting debacles we have. <laughs> <laughs> Enron, Tyco, WorldCom, HealthSouth, Bernie Madoff, I could have just kept going and going and going. Mm -hmm. We've had tons of those, uh, but they could be included in the bad column as well. So the good were good things, the bad were financial things that happened that weren't very pleasant. The ugly uh, actually had to do with loss of life because of poor ethical decisions that were made. <coughs> You guys remember the Ford Pinto? Yeah, we remember the Pinto. You're too young? I know about You drove a Pinto? Uh oh, hope you didn't have a rear crash. Rear uh, crash. No, we did. You did? We did, we did not. not. Oh. We did but, not. but we had the, I mean, we had a year, a model year that had the exploding oh. gas tank option. Right. <laughs> option. <laughs> yeah. So the problem was the gas tank in the rear and not up to standards. So it's up for discussion how many actual deaths there were. Of course, Ford says there were 23. Other critics say there were 500. A little bit of a gap there. In that period of time, from rear end crashes or rollovers. So it would have cost Ford between $5 and $7 per Pinto to remedy that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it, the, the problem was they were in a rush to enter the market. Normally it takes three years to produce and do your prototypes, et cetera, et cetera. They wanted to beat the Europeans getting into the market, so they pushed it and pushed it and pushed it for their desire to get into the market and ignored warnings that the gas tank was unsafe and that this is what, you know, this is what can happen. They actually did a cost versus benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. They said if we get sued because people die, 
this is how much it's going to cost us, versus this is how much it's going to cost us to put five to eight dollars into each car. They made a conscious decision, conscious decision, to not fix the, the gas tanks. That's just unfathomable to me. So here we saw ethical fading. There was a culture within the company to just produce, 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 produce at any cost, which cost some people their lives. Another ugly challenger. Did you know the challenger could have been avoided also? The O-rings, but they knew. Okay, come on. <coughs> Seven astronauts were killed. They knew the O-rings were vulnerable to failure in low temperatures. They knew that that was a problem, that there was a 99% chance of failure. The, um, <coughs> the, again, there was a management decision that was made to continue with the launch. They had the subcontractors that were evaluating the situation. There were three of them. Two of them said, th this is okay, go ahead. One says it's not safe, don't do it. But they felt pressure from the public, from their customer who was NASA, to go on ahead and, and do the launch. They had postponed it twice already, feeling pressure again. And so the third person gave in. So they had the group think, as well as ethical fading, <coughs> to go on ahead and do the launch. I remember where I was that day. That's one of those things, you know, shooting of Ronald Reagan, <laughs> the space shuttle, and I think 9-11. Um, In my lifetime, those are the things that I remember. So two of the three <coughs> um, were in favor of going ahead with the launch. One said no, um, but he went ahead and gave in. He felt pressured by his group, and he gave in. What do you see here? I really didn't transition very well there. What do you see here? See do you see it? Mm -hmm. I can see you see it, Christy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you see it? Mm -hmm. Is it difficult to see, though? Yes. yes. Yeah. <coughs> so does the black and white background keep her from noticing the Dalmatian? Here's his head, here's his legs, his back, his tail. Okay. So sometimes, um, similarly, might a profit-focused work environment be the black and white spots keep one from seeing the ethical implications of our actions, the Dalmatian. If you're surrounded by pressures to perform, pe pressures to meet deadlines, pressures to meet sales quotas, can we maybe sometimes get shadowed and not really um, see the forest for the trees? Perhaps our perception and de decision making are constrained in ways we didn't realize. So question, not your questions, my questions, questions I ask myself. What actions are being taken by companies regarding these ethics, regarding ethics, rather? So things that they can do, a lot of companies are conducting ethical training. They have codes of conduct. Johnson & Johnson has a credo where they pledge their services to their customers, not to the stakeholders, not to the government, but to their customers, to do good for their customers, regardless of the financial outcome. And since the Tylenol scare, Johnson & Johnson has, you know, that the Tylenol scare was a good thing that they did, then they've had other not so good things <laughs> <laughs> since then. <laughs> but we're not gonna talk about this. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Um, what are actions being taken by the accounting profession? So we have an AICPA code of professional conduct. We've had it for years. It gives us some guidance as far as um, independence from our clients and uh, things we can and cannot do. Um, as a CPA, we have to have ongoing ethics training. We have to have four hours of, of ethics training every two years, and that's required to maintain our license. The, um, <coughs> the government said, uh, accountants, you're not really doing your job well enough, so now we have Sarbanes-Oxley, also known as SOX, which was a result of the accounting debacles that we had in the early 2000s. They gave us additional guidance, kind of put fences around us, told us things we can and cannot do. A new <coughs> development for the accounting field anyway is now to be a CPA, you have to have an accounting ethics course. Business ethics doesn't count, it has to be accounting ethics. Mm -hmm. So now Adam Say has a new, account, a new yeah. class this semester. Accounting, oh. ethics. accounting ethics. So is that very recent then? Yep. Not just the class 
Uh, July. So yes, oh. July of this year. <coughs> Very new. Um, we're one of the last states to incorporate that. Most other states already had it, and now we do also. So then I asked the question, can ethics be taught? Can we teach ethics? Who's from such a small, intimate group? Marty, what do you think? 